Hail, and welcome to Heathen Hearth, the show where we make recipes inspired by the historic and ethnographic imagination. This week's episode is an interesting one. It was recorded at the Three Rivers Festival this year, and the episode is quite long, where we make three different kinds of ancient bread over an open fire. There were a few technical difficulties, so it kind of turns into a podcast at the end, but the information is still there. Enjoy! All right, everybody, so uh, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for coming out to my, uh, my workshop. My name is Oz. For those of you who aren't familiar, I'm one of the stewards here at The Land. But uh, like I mentioned, I also have the Heathen Hearth cooking show uh, on YouTube. That's my, one of my passions. And one of my passions is uh, reconstruction. So although I'm not a member of the ADF, I do uh, especially heathen reconstruction uh, religion. I was, uh, before the American Vinland Association, I'm sort of done. I was a member of that, and uh, I'm of uh, the non-racist, anti-racist heathens in the country. Fight the power. Um, so uh, just so, so you know who I am. But one of the things I'm interested in, obviously, is, is the match of history and understanding uh, and experimenting with it. So I do that with my religious and spiritual practice, and a lot of you do as well with uh, the ADF. And so you understand this need to look to the past, uh, look to history, and bring it forward into the present day and make it, uh, make it real. And part of the way I do that, especially with, um, uh, with, um, uh, with my spiritual practice, is that obviously a lot of our uh, spiritual practice involves giving of offerings, but it also involves eating communally. And uh, the Hale and Horn Gathering, which is the largest heathen event in, uh, in Canada specifically, we have a feast called a huso, which is the Anglo-Saxon term for a sacred feast. Uh, some bullows, of course, the sacred uh, drinking ceremony, etc. But that idea of, of bread also is very important to our, uh, to our, a lot of the, the cultures and the hearth cultures, obviously, of all of the, uh, of the ADF. In fact, the word Lord in, uh, in English comes from um, uh, master of the loaf, right? So it's, it's the, the, the ability to come together in community is the ability to gather food together and the ability to distribute it. So the basis for the, a lot of European culture um, emerged at this point um, when grain started to be um, uh, the center of society uh, during the Neolithic. And of course, there's a lot of interesting research going on right now uh, about those migrations. Because we have the ability to do better genetic testing, so we understand how populations move and we can match it to the archaeological record. So there's really cool stuff happening. Uh, now, I'm, I've been out of touch because my master's degree in anthropology is like, you know, 20 years old or so. So, but, uh, but I've been reading a little bit. And one of the things I wanted to do here is go beyond that, that oven over there. We have a, a mud oven and I've cooked there before uh, ancient bread, but it was only so ancient as you know, ovens. Today we're going to go pre-oven uh, in, in, our, in, a, in, our, in our cooking. So uh, I'm looking up here what I actually named the breads. Let's see. Uh, oh yeah, okay. So uh, we're going to be making three different breads from three different time periods using three different grains and three slightly different cooking techniques. And that's what I wanted. So I wanted to show you that diversity. Uh, first, we're going to be making a, something I call farrels on the fire. Now, farrel is uh, in uh, uh, the, the modern traditional recipe for a farrel is kind of like a scone, right? Like it's a wedge and it's a, a bread usually often raised with um, a chemical leavener rather than a yeast or a sourdough. And so um, that's uh, we consider it old because it's from the 1800s, but that's not the old version of a farrel. A farrel just means a wedge. Right, and it's Scots Gaelic, essentially. So a slice. It's like saying I'm having a slice, except it means pizza in New York, and in Scotland it means like a flatbread, right? So the farrel on the fire is going to be cooked with oats because oats is one of the dominant grains, obviously, of Scotland. And so what we're going to be going to is the 1700s for this recipe. So this is the most modern recipe, but it's still more ancient than most people are probably used to when they're eating a farrel, right? And so we're going to be using um, our uh, oats, but to make it more ancient, I'm going to be using sprouted oats. So we have a sprouted oats. And the reason that I selected sprouted oats was because one of the really cool things about the funnel beaker culture, which a lot of you are uh, familiar with, which is essentially uh, proto-Celtic 
cult culture I think uh, based on modern um, archaeology they often buried their grain to store it and so sometimes they did this in a clay lined pit sometimes they did it in an actual funnel but they would often cap it off with a with a turf turned around or uh, a cap of clay right and the interesting thing about this is that the grain that was stored um, it wasn't airtight and it was rather moist. And so what the archeologists were thinking in these conditions, well, how did they store grain that was fairly, in a fairly moist conditions and still keep it fresh? Well, the reason was, is because the clay around the outside, even though it was moist and it, 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 the, the pottery they had was permeable to the, um, to the ground moisture, what it wasn't was very permeable to air. And so when uh, the top layer often that was uh, in most contact with the air would sprout and malt and one of the things uh, that it did is it gives off carbon dioxide and so it would actually kill microbes inside and stop the sprouting of the rest of the grain so the top portion of the grain might be unusable because it's too sprouted and some of it might rot and so you take that away but what would happen is through your grain supply it would be more sprouted and malted at the top to the bottom so what you're often cooking with is not just straight grain like today we immediately stop the grain from sprouting and we often don't uh, eat malted grain, which is sprouted grain, unless you uh, have it specifically for beer. But basically wheat, uh, uh, any grain, was essentially sprouted at the time because of the way they stored it. So that's why I wanted, I've never tried it with, spr with, with sprouted, partly sprouted oats, but I'm, what I'm hoping for is essentially a taste of a more ancient version of uh, an oat flatbread. So that's what I'm doing with, the, with, with that one. So that's going to be cool. Um, oh, I haven't introduced my lovely assistant, Tim Woo! Winter Owl. So uh, I, I, we didn't really plan a lot, so I'm going to be telling a lot of talking, and he's we're going to be <laughs> helping each other out, right? So, um, uh, but and then the next one I'm going to be doing uh, is call, I'm calling Grass Ocean Bread, and what that one is is going to be with uh, this. Um, oh, you know what? I'll pass these around so people can look at it. We're going to do hands-on uh, grinding, but you can just take a look at let these and uh, pass this one around. This one is uh, hullless barley, so it's an older varietal of barley that has uh, more of the out uh, the outside husk on it. Uh, so you're probably used to polished or pot barley. This is actually the grain in its more um, a more complete form, and. Uh, it's a really interesting dish that they have and they currently make still in Tibet and it's a travel food so the travel food is you parch the grain first and this is common in North America too. First Nations did it here with corn they parch the grain and then they'd make items out of it because essentially it's cooked it's cooked uh, dry grain uh, the settlers used to do that as well it used to be during the Revolutionary War in the States almost everybody had parched grain in their in their in the, the saddlebags but it's, an, it's a really old uh, technique wherever people use grain in their food supply. And what the Tibetans do uh, currently is they parch their grain very dark. So parching essentially means reducing the moisture content and cooking it. You can do this, most people do it in an oven now because it's easier to control. But the original way to do it was on a pan or over an open fire or you know before that just on a stone, right? Like you just, <laughs> it's a tough job because you got to use your hand to move it around. Um, but uh, what you do is you parch it. And because of parching, you can eat it uh, without cooking it. And in Tibet, this is very useful because basically on the, in the high plains, all you have is dung to cook with, right? And sometimes it may be snowing, and so it's difficult for a fire. Uh, what we also find in some of the historical texts, though, is that the Mongols also used this method. So you could, they could live off their herds. And the reason I called it grass ocean bread is because this technique is common to all of the peoples of the grass plain of Asia. So all the way up to the highlands of Tibet where it's still done more often, but all the way uh, uh, anywhere, where the Turkic peoples went, where the, uh, the Hunnic peoples went, where the, um, uh, where the Mongol peoples went, all of these peoples, uh, the thing they have in common is not language, it's not culture, it's the fact that they use the same environment and they're pastoralists, and they're in that vast ocean. And I thought back, well, who was uh, one of the original cultures that dominated that region at the time when grain agriculture emerged 
Well, it was the Proto-Indo-Europeans. It was essentially the original first ancestors of most of, most of our spiritual traditions, of our mythologies. And it's, we can't tell from the archaeological record if they ate this or not, just because it's, it's a food preparation technique, an eating technique, but based on their technology and their culture and the widespread nature of it across this entire area, it's probably a very ancient method. So my imagination is that this was used. And the dominant way it's used is it's parched so that you can, you can grind it and mash it up um, and make it into flour. And you can mix it with whatever liquid you have available. Uh, and it could be hot, it could be cold, it's all edible. So in modern Tibet, they drank salted tea with yak butter, with uh, fermented yak butter. So they mix their barley with that and they can make it into a porridge or they can use it cold and just mix it up and make it denser and make it into little balls that they can pop while they're riding. Uh, the Mongols used to do the exact same thing, except they used to also mix, known to have mixed it with blood uh, from their horses or mare's milk or kumis, which is the uh, fermented mare's milk that they would carry with them on their saddlebags, so it would ferment. Uh, it usually went to around 2-3%. Uh, the Bactrian camels, similar kind of thing. Uh, in the, the drier areas uh, were also used for the same purposes. And um, uh, blood, uh, I mentioned the blood, yeah, blood. So you can mix it with blood to make a sort of a clotted pudding, whatever. It's basically travel food that you take with you on your, with your herds. So I'm gonna be making, not blood, milk, whatever. We're gonna be making the, we're gonna be parching some of the, bar, uh, the barley here. And then we're gonna be making a very basic version, which will just be mixed with water uh, at the fire. So that's not, not actually gonna be cooked. It's gonna be cooked here, and then we're gonna grind it. And then the third bread we've got that I'm gonna be making is something that I called, let me look it up, <laughs> Iceman bread. All right, so, so some of you may be familiar with the uh, Iceman find. It was on the border of uh, Austria and Italy. Uh, up in the Alps, uh, a, a glacier uh, started to melt, uh, probably due to global warming. Uh, but through amazing circumstances, someone happened to come across it. And due to even more amazing circumstances, they recognized that it was uh, an ancient body. And the body is 5,300 uh, before Common Era. So very, very long time ago, but amazingly preserved. And so we could know what the last meal of this person was, besides all sorts of other cool stuff about them. And uh, they're known as Otzi, just because that's the sort of the, the area they were found in. So Otzi the Iceman, uh, his last meal, he was in his 50s. Uh, he was shot in the back. Uh, with a flint-tipped arrow, uh, probably fell down, hit, cracked his head uh, as he was dying and just happened to have been preserved. But the last thing he ate was ibex jerky, which is a type of wild goat. And the bread he ate was a very simple bread made of einkorn wheat. Now, there are three different sort of species of wheat. The modern variety is all, all, moder all of our modern varieties is all made from just one of the species. This is one of the other ones. And it was preserved uh, uh, as, a, as a modern cultivar because it is very useful uh, on tiny plots of land, especially in very uh, sloped areas, so in the mountains. So his body was found in Austria, in the Alps. But the thing is, the modern wheat variety was also taken from Switzerland in the Alps because they had farmed it up until modern times, right? And a lot of our genetic diversity in our grain crops has disappeared, but this one stuck around. The cool thing is it stuck around in the exact same region where he was first eating this. And it's, uh, it, compared to other grains, uh, like you're used to seeing wheat fields and they're, they're fairly tall. You think the tall wheat fields, but wheat used to be, some varieties of wheat are much shorter, like farro and it falls over. And another variety of the einkorn grows much, much, uh, I think it's taller, but what it really does is it holds on. So it doesn't fall off or shed or anything. And the reason that that's so useful is because they're cutting it by hand with sickles made with flint, right? And so it's like a saw basically. So it's shaken around and you've got to carry it and put it in sheaves and stuff like that. So it's a very useful variety of wheat. If you, but, but ridiculously labor intensive nowadays, right? So it's totally useless as a modern variety of wheat because it costs so much to produce. Uh, but we do have uh, some, of the, some of the flour here. So we're gonna be just essentially making uh, that bread. And when he died though, he was basically on the run, uh, it seems. There seemed to have been, he died violently. There was probably some sort of conflict going on. 
Um, due to the pollen in his body, he'd gone like up and down the Alps several times in the days pr just before his death. And so when he was eating, he's obviously eating jerky. He's just eating stuff he can carry. So again, a travel food, right? Like an emergency food. And just they just grabbed enough grain. And when you do that, you don't have time to let a sourdough start, starter uh, culture form in it uh, from the air. You don't have time to milk a cow or get any other ingredients. So again, this is just going to be grain and water. But he also didn't have the equipment and they're moving quick. So they likely just made ash, ash cakes. So ash fire. And this is a method of cooking where you just put the bread directly into the fire right on top of the ashes uh, when the fire has, uh, has sort of died down. So that's the last bread we're going to be making. And then you just brush the ashes off afterwards. So uh, in a lot of ancient people too, if they were not in a place near a salt region, there's certain kinds of plants that you burn on the embers so that that ash is at the top and then you bake your bread on it and it has more salt and it, the, it actually adds flavor. So for instance, Colt's foot is something First Nations in, in Canada used and it was used in Britain. Um, uh, on the seashore, if you didn't want to make salt, usually they had salt, but a poor person wouldn't. So they just burn seaweed, right? And have that as the top layer and then cook their bread on in the ashes on that. So it's just a, it's an interesting technique. So we're going to experiment with that. So I haven't made any of these before. So all of this is going to be experimentation and uh, it'll, usually, it'll usually turn out uh, pr pretty good. So um, before we go on to the hands-on part, where I'm going to get people to come up here, um, uh, what, uh, what we don't have, you'll notice, is an actual grindstone. So like a, an actual small hand mill. They cost a lot, and I don't have one yet. But also, we don't have, we don't have the stone that you grind with either, which is the even older version. Um, that takes a long time. I have my Vitamix and the grain attachment. And you can you know, do your own grain grinding at home, too. And then we have an electric frying pan. Instead of messing around over the hot fire and then, you know, accidentally burning the grain, we're just going to I'm just going to parch it on this. So, uh, does anybody have any questions about any of that? That's essentially the historic part uh, and the notes and the reasons why I selected these uh, different uh, different grains. And then from here on out, it's just going to be us messing around and seeing how this stuff cooks. Uh, once we get over to the fire pit afterwards, though, I'm going to explain. Uh, the cooking equipment we'll be using as well. So uh, some of it is uh, historical reproductions or antiques. So you probably want to know about those as well. Are there any questions before we go on with anything? No? Okay, so who wants to help out? Come on up. We're going to be parching grain and we're going to be grinding flour. Is basically what this we're is part of the reason I put myself so damn close to the camera. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so let's turn this up. Uh, three, two, three. Less to move. So does anybody here make flatbreads for themselves? Like, uh, at home? You do? Yeah. You make flatbreads at home at all? Or oat cakes or things like that? Okay, so that means uh, we're going to have you grind the oat flour. <laughs> Come on up! And this is all being played by ear, right? So, uh, is anybody here allergic to dairy? Because I was planning on putting butter into the oat cakes. Allergic to dairy? Did you really want to try an oat cake? Okay, all right, okay, okay, all right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one of the cool, one of the things about modern grinding equipment too is it grinds things really, really evenly. And uh, because we're doing, uh, I wanted to make these really ancient, the, the it's a really hard to get an even grind when you just have a, a small stone in your hand and a large stone on the bottom. And a blender actually comes out roughly the same as that. Uh, so, uh, let's see how this thing tastes. A pretty uh, usable food processor. Yeah, it would come out roughly the same. This is the special grain attachment, so it doesn't get bunged, bunged up, but uh, um, so we'll do it in small batches, I guess. So this is done. Yeah, I was gonna say that should be. So, since you've made oat cakes, uh, what what fineness of uh, you use pin oats, or what kind of fineness do you use usually? I'm going three and I'm Yeah. Going pretty fine. Okay. So we'll do a mix, I guess, to hold them because it holds together better when it's really fine. Yeah. And, okay. So maybe we'll try a bit of that then. Um, so yeah. So all you gotta do is have you used a Vitamix before? No, I'm okay. Not all right, so Vitamix, um, this is, let's see if this is turned on. 
Yeah. Okay, so there's just on and off, and then this does power. So what you do is just watch it to make sure that you have the, the right um, consistency. Okay. And just stop when, just hit the button again when it stops. So here, I'll just turn this on for you. So you just keep it stirring, and then tell me when it's uh, when it starts to turn red. Okay. okay. transforms the starches into sugars and so that's what per is fermenting in beer so this the oat cakes should actually taste sweeter they're not going to be sweetened but they'll have malted so they taste, should taste a little sweet but the barley shouldn't taste sweet so. Where did you get your, um, sprouted? the sprouted grain uh, probably have to hit this button oh no I got unplugged uh, I got uh, I got mine at Rainbow Foods in Ottawa. Oh, okay. A raid for Rainbow. Yeah. So Rainbow Foods has, I think, the greatest diversity of items. It's hard to find einkorn anywhere else except for Rainbow. Foods. because that was a common way, especially in, um, in Caithness. So you know in Northern Scotland how there's, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the provinces in Northern Scotland, but Caithness is the one that's on the very top point, uh, right before you get to Orkney. And so it's, on, it's sort of in between Orkney and the Western Isles. So those are both off. It's just like a blasted, terrible Basically, and so the uh, I made a I made a recipe that was uh, sort of from there, and so because it's super hard to dry anything in that location, you have to parch your grains basically for them to survive. So uh, their bread often had that kind of nutty taste to it, just because all the grains. You could see all the grains, and then just all of a sudden it started to like expand. Oh, so we've got some pretty good toasting. This isn't moving anymore. Okay, cool. Yeah, Alright, so, so now just take your spoon and put it in that jar. Alright, so let's see. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. We want to just keep it going. You just want, yeah. you would definitely want just the color to change and see if we can pop most of it. Okay, I can keep it going. Yeah. You just have to make sure it doesn't, doesn't start burning. I hadn't 
parched barley before. I've only parched but other why, grains, so. Really, why yeah, if it's got the hull on it, like a piece of corn. corn. Yeah. Corn yeah. Like well, well, only um, only one kind of corn pops. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah, because there's flint, dent, and sweet corn, yeah. sweet corn varieties, and um, the popcorn variety is a flint variety. I think some dent corns may pop, but not easily. Probably like this pops. Yeah, yeah, more like this. Wouldn't be the nice big, nice pops. Yeah, amaranth pops like this too. Yeah. Oh, Little tiny, good. tiny, tiny popcorn. Cool. You might want to turn it down a little bit. Yeah, I am. We want a really dark color. Okay. When I've seen the uh, Tibetan, like a picture of the Tibetan stuff, it looks pretty dark. So. Okay. Yes, they have done. Um, I typically toast my own sesame seeds. So. Yes, and we're gonna eat this raw, right? Yeah. So we have to make sure yeah. that it's super well cooked, because when we when we grind the flour, it will be. Uh, yeah. So this, this is, this is the cooking part. Yeah, I was gonna say this one. This is what makes the kaitos. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. yeah. yeah. Uh, were you gonna do another? Uh, do, you want, do we want to do more? Yeah, let's do some more of this. Let's see here. Let's do the. Uh, do more of it. So this is this one's for making flatbreads. Uh, this one is for reheating bread or um, cooking meat on it. So uh, the flatbreads usually only taste good when they're warm, <laughs> or you want to turn them into a cracker. So this is this is good for that. These irons, um, a Viking fire pit uh, often had um, higher sides on it, and uh, they had flattened stones. So what you do is it's a lot easier. You'd, you'd put it just near, and it would be a long trench, it would be narrower than this. So you'd put your piece like this, and you just put a stone on this, and so it would hold it. So you didn't have to do this the entire time, because yeah. this is really annoying. But <laughs> you can, uh, we're not, I'm not planning on, uh, wasn't planning on cooking with these today, but if anybody wants to mess around with some of the dough, you can pass those around, you can, you can try it. But this is the one for the first, uh, for the first, I wanted to use this, so this is actually, I found it really cheap at uh, an antique shop uh, because they didn't know what it was, <laughs> but it flattens down, and this is the exact kind they used to use basically from the 1600s up until the, uh, uh, the 1800s, uh, oh, so the early 1900s in Scotland and in Canada, so a lot of pioneers would have had this exact kind, I don't know how old this one is. Um, and you can see also two ones that are like this, where the bottom plate isn't uh, isn't steel; it's like soapstone. And then it's just a metal ring here because the metal was expensive and the soapstone was cheap. Uh, so you have those versions as well, which is obviously um, essentially just an evolution of using a flat stone on the fire, right? 
Uh, and you have the same flat, a similar kind of flatbread tradition in North America too. Uh, so you have uh, in Mexico, the comal is where you cook tortillas and it's essentially a big flat piece of iron. Originally, that was a big flat, flat piece of pottery, right? And um, uh, in the American Southwest, they still have a flatbread tradition in which they cook blue corn on a flat piece of granite. So you can see there too, the exact same evolution, right? It's the exact same evolution of cooking. So this is uh, what we're gonna be using to cook the, uh, the oat cakes. The fire now is a nice burned down state. So what I did, because we had poured water in the fire before, I took two flat logs, put them down so that it wasn't wet. And then I used birch bark here that's fallen on the ground, which has a lot of resin, and a few pieces of lower branch dead white pine, which is always dead, so it's always available and dry. And then over in the wood pile, there's local wood here, and on the right hand side is softwood white pine. So basically your deciduous trees are almost always softwood in North America and in Europe. And that wood burns with like a nasty creosote smoke, makes food usually taste bad, uh, depending on how you cook it or where you position it in the smoke layer. So there's a lot of Scandinavian stuff that you can do, like with smoked juniper and stuff, but you have to be careful how you do it, otherwise it can taste gross. Um, because essentially what you're doing is you have to think a lot of industrial products were made out of that type of sap. So essentially the six, like the, the medieval version of like plastic coatings was made out of birch sap, uh, out of sap from uh, deciduous trees like that. And then you have your hardwoods, right? So are usually deciduous. And here we've got um, some nice uh, oak, uh, oaks and elms, uh, etc. And uh, I think we have a bit of ash. So ash is good for wood handles and things like that. But it's also those woods are also the ones that are the densest and provide the least amount of smoke and the maximum amount of heat. And so deciduous flames, pro uh, I mean the, the softwoods provide lots of uh, flame, but not as nearly as much heat. And so when you're cooking, most of the time, for most of human history, you didn't want smoke because this was in your house and it's hot and crappy enough without smoke blowing your face uh, to cook. So you want the minimum amount of fuel for the maximum amount of heat for the extended period of time. So if you're using a, a softwood, you get tons of smoke and you have to cook very quickly. But you notice that a lot of European recipes, they had tons of hardwood. And that's why we have a roasted food tradition, not like in China, where you have a flash fry tradition, right? And we also don't have a just boiled tradition because we're not like just, we're not cooking on dung fires like they do in Tibet or like Northern India, right? So we, we have a, because in Northern India, you notice almost everything is in a sealed pot, right? Because again, smoke smells gross. The smoke smells gross from that, those fuels, right? But these smokes are pretty good. Like they, they're nice, uh, even if you get a little bit of it. So uh, Europeans tend to have these kinds of things. And that's also too why the British uh, had more of the roast meat tradition because they were more in, for most of their history until the Industrial Revolution, they had more trees than any other European did uh, until you got to Eastern Europe, essentially, right? But more hardwoods, I should say, access to more hardwoods for fuel. <coughs> Um, okay, so that's uh, the, that's essentially what I was going to say about wood. Did you have any other co questions about the wood? No, I was just curious. Yeah. So I know you can use uh, like apple wood or fruit wood, but I don't know how those would burn. They burn very hot. Uh, when you're using wood as a flavoring, what you're often doing though is smoldering it on the edge. So if it's uh, if it's if it's specifically added almost like a spice, like they do in American barbecue, for instance, um, you would be you don't usually burn the entire fire with it. Sometimes you can, um, and it's good to do that, but that usually only happens in a region where that wood is super dominant, right? Like, so in uh, in the UK, uh, some of the smoked cheeses are made with apple wood, like just apple wood, but that's because it's part of the off trimmings of the orchard industry, right? And in, Nor in, uh, in uh, the Caribbean, what uh, the tradition of, um, jerk chicken like in uh, it's it's burned on pimento wood so that's the same thing that makes allspice berries so the allspice berry tree uh, is and they often they often start a fire with it and then they'll just put logs on but it'll be like one or two logs and they'll make sure that it's a smoldering log that gives off a lot of smoke so it has to do with also how you manage your fire and that's a thing nowadays we just turn it up 
we even have a thermometer on our fires. Uh, the one over there, you have to put your arm in and like hold it for a couple seconds and like, okay, is that hot enough? Um, we use an electronic. You use an electronic? Yeah, yeah I mean, but and to cook on an open fire, you just need you need a lot of experience, and most of us don't have experience with keeping a fire going or trying to get it for different purposes. Usually we're just trying to use it for light. In which case, all you need is a hardwood base and then you throw on softwood pieces every now and then to get lots of light. Uh, but when you're cooking with it, it's a whole different, it's a much more scientific uh, uh, experience. So, so on, on the fruit woods and stuff, yeah. now, when, when, because tr modern smoking, yeah. we soak our wood chips. Now, would, would yeah. that be the same technique that they used back then, was to soak them to get them to smolder, or would they actually just burn them on the side, dry? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. You, it make, makes sense to soak it. Well, oftentimes we get an old, an age, too. Even that or burn it green. Yeah, they were, that, what I, that was, yeah, I was about to say, like, if, for instance, in Spain, where... <laughs>
uh, the Roma people uh, tribe, the, they're often called tribe, the, sort of the Roma people of the UK. So the English Roma would be the, if you're not familiar with Roma, it's like outsiders called for years the gypsies, right, of England. And so um, they used this specific kind of spike because they didn't, uh, they didn't use uh, tripods very often. They just used this because they were moving more quickly. Uh, but this is not, this isn't native uh, to, uh, to only their culture. Uh, it's used in India, which, you know, they have roots, roots there. But it's also used in a lot of different other areas. It just makes sense as a tool, right? So what you do is you just jam it in sideways and then hang whatever you got over top. You can't take as much weight. Um, and also because rocky ground, it becomes difficult to use. But uh, it's used as well. So, uh, and that's why we call it the yag the yag, because it has all these different meanings. It has the meaning of hearth, it has short forms, and so on. So, so this is the yag spike, and then we have the, the tripod. So um, what would you guys like to use? You can choose either one. I gather you Yeah, the chain goes on both. Oh, chain, chain goes on both. Yeah, that, so that's the height. Because there's different ways to change the heat. Um, this one's just harder to position. Yeah, so there's different ways to control your temperature. A lot of people think, oh, I need to control my temperature just with the coals or the fire and make the flame. The heat, the heat um, is usually from, uh, it's better from uh, radiant cooking, right? So you're not, you're not, you don't really want a lot of flame. What you want to do is you want to move your pot farther or closer. Let's see how this one goes. Things called an S hook. And although these things are made of metal right now, right? Um, well, that's way too. Yeah, but then I can't low, uh, lower it and yeah. raise it. So I'll just do it this way. Yeah, I do that. So I'll just heat that up for now. So um, yeah, so that just goes goes up. All right. So uh, now it's just a matter of forming the oat with water and a little bit of uh, butter. And uh, so who's got the? I was just messing with the fire. So who's got the cleanest hands? Come over. And... All right. Come on over. No, uh, that's the barley. That, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. You can wipe your hands off after all that. They also are taking rings off. I can hold the rings. So what I also have is a um, rolling pin. Uh, this is slightly more mod. Oops, I forgot to clean off that part. It won't work. Um, this is obviously doesn't have the bearing in it, but a rolling pin was just actually a stick, like a turned stick. This is all high tech because this, these parts are shorter than this part. So there you go. It's like, but I, don't, I think we can probably just warm it by hand. All right, so there you go. There's a little bit of oat. So just take uh, a butter. And then crumble it in like you would to make a pie crust, basically, but by finger. Well, as they say in the old recipes, a knob. Yeah, a knob. Yeah, but we want to make it rich because we're we're wealthy, right? We're wealthy. Okay. So yeah, just just pinch it, pinch it all together. Just to basically, you just want to rub it all in. Yeah, yeah, you want a grainy texture, and then we just what we do is we just add enough water to make it hold together. After that, we're not even adding salt or anything to this. We salted butter, but.
Oh yeah, yeah, the tiny little pots. It's quite good. Yeah. Yeah. But I really should have just saved like bacon drippings and yeah, that's really good. When I first moved here, um, we told everybody to save their bacon fat and yeah. put it in the freezer. And I keep mine in the fridge. Same here. Yeah. yeah. I keep it too. Well, I did that here. And People thought you were weird. Everybody thought it was weird. Well, well, it wasn't more like when people were scared of fat in the 80s and 90s, yeah. no one was doing it. Yeah, we didn't have that here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a citrus juice cream there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I like the Newfie version too, though. It's just like buy salt salt pork, yeah. just the slab, yeah, yeah. and just cut it. Because then you get the scrunchins oh, too. Scrunchins. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Marina did that at KG last year. She made a whole, we got the salt pork. It's all good. Yeah. Pretty much just the butter with like one tablespoon of water. Yeah, it should be barely any. That's why it'll taste super yummy. So basically, you just form it into a circle, about uh, uh, about a just less than a centimeter thick. So it has to be as thin as you can get it, so it doesn't fall apart. Basically, yeah. So it's around that, and then form in the edges. Circle, but it's round ish. Okay. Well, actually, it's perfect. Yep. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Can we transfer? Yeah, I lifted it off so it's not stuck down very much. All right, let's make, uh, make another one. Maybe we'll try one. Try one without butter. See if it goes with just water. See if, what the difference is. Okay. Would you like you want me to keep going since I'm already? Or whoever wants to do it. You try Anybody else? Yeah. Anybody just else else try without butter. Water? Yeah, I can do it without water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, with just okay. water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can flip the board. Absolutely. There we go. We'll avoid that cross contamination. We'll just have the log contamination. Yeah. Uh, on the other side of that tent. It's hooked up? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the sink underneath that little uh, area. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Uh, there might, I think there's soap underneath too. I was going to say, I, I, that's, that's okay. okay. Yeah, I'm going to wash my hands so I can make some barley. Yeah. Great. Wait till we try it. Mm. Here. No. Don't mind me. I'm lost. So. And 
there's soap underneath. Oh, hi, buddy. Go away. Yeah, with the butter, you need a little bit of soap to get rid of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that recipe is something I think I would definitely try at home because... Uh, it's super simple. Well, I'm not supposed to have wheat, rye, or barley on celiac. Oh, okay, yeah. I've been cheating a little bit, so I've had some of it, but ideally, I'm not supposed to be having it. Okay. And that oat one is perfect because it's just oat flour. Yeah, and you can, you can play around with it, too, so... Oh, yeah. yeah. It works best on, like, a piece. Or you can do a cast iron pan too, like uh, you started. Okay, so while we're waiting for these to cook, it's our next one. Does anybody want to mix this or uh, I can hand it out? This is the barley. You want to try? So this is like, okay, who's going to pretend to be on horseback? <laughs> we're going to cook in itself. Yeah. <laughs> that came from like a couple of people. Hey. All right, so who wants to try it? This is, this is super simple. It's basically right. you get this in your hand, you get a little bit of water put in, and you mix it into a ball. Okay. Oh, it's, it's still warm for me. Yeah. Parching. That's yeah. Okay, so let's spread it out so there's a little well there, and uh, so you can work that into a ball. You can try. Oh, sure. This is where we all get our hands dirty. We know we can wash them over at the other place. Uh, this is your snack. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna try to... Sorry for the interruption. Oh, it's good. Okay. So if you need more water, try it a little bit. Okay, there we are. Ooh, that's beautiful. Oh, you want me to like it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you just pour it to yourself so you can know. Please, Jack, can I have some more? I've got water next to okay, that good. I can use. Sorry, I got a little bit of water. Can try, try? So this is like, imagine you're on a vast grassland. Oh, I like the color. Yeah. It should be nice and toasty. Yep. Yeah. I think the idea is like you can you just pour it into a little ball and eat it, mm. or you can like let it dry that's out. Really or... Oh, that's delicious. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I gotta... Here, I'm gonna... No, no, I'm to I want to make my own too, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> he wants some of them. Do you guys one. want some back there? Christina and Miss? Do you want to make a proto Indo European bread ball? Oh, okay. oh you haven't had it? Okay. Uh, there might be hard to get off the board. Some more water. I have a butter bottle beside me. It's it's hard to do. Need a bit more, do you think? I don't know. What if you oh, get, like? You just want it to hold together. For the Can we get the water? Well, shit. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, I, I'm just guessing. Um, basically, you just do it till it holds together. Oftentimes, they would do this like, you know. If you if you if you couldn't stop, you could do it while you're on your horse. But usually, oh, you drop some. Here, come on, turn it. Um, come on, the horse was bumpy. <laughs> I'm not the best rider, okay. <laughs> yeah, or it could have been made like uh, you know when you're breaking camp in the morning or something like that. But and then have it handy to yeah. just kind of munch on for the day. But a lot of them, uh, the especially the warriors, they would uh, they would not sleep. They would sleep on horseback, right? So what you'd have is each person would have their own mount, and they'd have a small herd of horses behind them, usually like five or six, and they'd swap those out for 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 fresh horses. And that way, also too, you could take blood from horses, and they wouldn't have to carry you until they were. Again. Into their healed again, but it also meant that you could keep going essentially non stop because once you're there's a lot of you, the horses just follow in a giant herd. So you only need like uh, riders awake at the very front and at the very back, and the rest of the army can sleep on horseback. They'd strap themselves in, and the horses would just keep moving. 
And so, the horses meet the sweep? Can yeah, not as much sweep though. Walking? Not as much. Like oh. the ones in the back, like could just, just like while they were moving, could kind of no. like sleep. Like horses sleep standing up too, right? But they do stop. Yeah, I thought they they stopped. Yeah, walking but they can they keep sleep. going a, a lot longer than a person can. So they would bleed the horses with the blood, but not torture them. Like yeah, they, yeah. The Maasai still do that is with their cows, and actually the Scottish Highlanders. So this was actually a practice of Celtic peoples, because the Highlanders, when they had uh, the Highland cows, and originally the Highland cows weren't these these big yellow things that monstrosities that the Victorians bred. They were originally a lot more like the Dexter cow, the tiny black cows of Ireland, except they were super fuzzy and furry. So what the Highlanders used to do is like they would have to herd them down to the lowlands. And it would take several weeks. And it was at the end of the season when they had almost no money and nothing. So what they often did was um, they would uh, bleed the cattle. And so that's what they do with the, they, There's actually a specific technique that I can't remember. There's some poems talking about the techniques with their skin, their like, their skin dues, their uh, knives, and they just take them and they bleed the cattle and drink from it. It was like just showing how like tough and barbaric the uh, Highlanders were. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah, we'll take a look and see if it's toasting, and otherwise we might have to lower the uh, hand. Bit. Yeah, it's well, usually it is, right? Like it's a, it's another. But uh, yeah, and it'll probably break apart. But. Yeah. And you have to think too, animal breeding used to be way more seasonal, right? So there's only certain times of year it makes sense to kill an animal, right? Okay. So you, and basically there's no refrigeration, um, so you're not getting meat for much of the year. Basically you're eating the blood or you're getting dairy. And that's essentially your only food. Like the Maasai, they pretty well survive on meat, uh, meat and dairy, but most of the year it's actually pretty well just dairy. And they're a modern uh, pastoral people that, uh, right? So it just, they're African, obviously, but it, it's just, it's based on the, the, the technology that you have, essentially your food culture, right? It's, it's interesting you mention that, though. I don't know if anyone's read, um, there was a writer called Bruce Lincoln who, who did his PhD thesis comparing Irish cattle lore and Maasai anthropology. Yeah. Well, I haven't read that, but that's, <laughs> obviously I've read people who, like, may come to the same conclusions, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, Oh yeah, so that was uh, too much butter, I guess then. Obviously there's techniques to this, right? But it, it should taste good still. Yeah, come get some uh, more. So when you go to turn the other one. Oh, okay, all right. Oh yeah, so that's, uh, that holds together really nicely. My thought was because of the dairy thing, if you had like the fermented, a fermented milk or something mm -hmm. in it, it would change the flavor again. Yeah, well, according to the accounts of at least the Mongols, they basically didn't uh, drink water. They drank kumis. So they were basically just drinking either plain whey or the uh, basically that sort of yogurt alcohol drink, mm -hmm. which is what kumis is. It tastes a lot like pizza, actually. I made it with kumis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And supposedly, I, I was actually on this YouTube channel of this Mongolian cooking channel, and uh, he said that I asked them if the Bactrian uh, camel milk kumis came out with higher alcohol content, and they said it actually came out lower because it has more butter fat in it. Neat. So the mare's milk had more protein uh, and sugars, I guess. So. Yeah, because yeah, it's the sugars that directly convert the alcohol. Alcohol, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the 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 thing about uh, when they say yak butter tea too, they're making it from actually yak butter. But the thing is, the butter is different. Like their butter technology is different. They actually have fermented butter. So I've never actually had fermented butter. We've had cultured butter, but that's very different than fermented butter because it's aged. So Celtic bog butter. This used to be a tradition in Europe. Is that you take your butter, your cultured butter, and then you bury it in an anaerobic. Um, condition so usually in actually actually in the bog water usually in the tannin layer where the stuff was rotting and then that way there'd be no oxygen in the water basically none 
and it would preserve, but that way the anaerobic bacteria could work on the butter and it preserved for years and years, but it changed the flavor. And so I have a feeling it kind of changes the flavor maybe of the yak butter. Like, I don't know if it does or not, but it supposedly had this funky taste. And in North Africa, they have this uh, butter called smen. Um, it's hard to pronounce. I don't know, it's like an Arabic vowel. But they essentially have a, um, a butter that is super funky too. And the same thing in Ethiopia, they have, but they spice it. Yeah, that's definitely a... Woo! So we must have... Like, yep. No, no, part of it. Yeah. 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 Um, so we're getting close to fall, so I should be heading back to the egg. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, because some people may want to may want sooner. I would do the other bread, so I'll just finish it up with them. This is getting close to being done, so. All right. Thanks. I mean, I can stay. Um, I think I got it. All right, thank you. No worries, thank you. Want me to save you uh, Iceman? Uh... Absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, the barley? No, it's exactly, right? Yeah. And if you think, you know, stuff like Christmas cookies is where you save the old and weird and fantastic tradition. Yeah. You know? it, it stays a few more generations than, like, regular day-to-day -day food, right? Yeah. But when you think about traditional recipes, like, it's funny because a lot of traditional recipes first appeared on the back of a can in the early 1900s nowadays. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. So... <laughs> yeah, you know, or, well, it doesn't really matter, but, but, and even before that, like, even in the 60s, the traditional recipes, you're involving, like, uh, leavening agents, right? Like, a chemical leavening agent, pearl ash was the first chemical leavening agent essentially used, and that was only, only started to be used in the 1700s, late 1700s, right? Oh, no, mid-1700s. And then the baking soda was really, baking soda and baking powder only became common after 1850. Like they were modern ingredients. And those are the earliest cookbooks in, that we have for North America were written in around the 1850s, generally speaking. There's stuff from the, from the States that's the 1700s with pearl ash and stuff. But in Canada, we don't have a lot of cookbooks before uh, the 1800s. And so our earliest recipes, that they were actually teaching people how to use modern Thing. So that cookbook with like baking soda recipes was their version of like microwave cooking for your family, right? right? <laughs> that was that was like what like it was like the modern housewife. You're using an enclosed oven, not an open fire. Wow, it's a cast iron oven. You have to learn how to use it. So we're gonna write recipes, and also too, you don't have to worry about your sourdough freaking out, and because the heat in your cabin is like. You forgot to heat your cabin overnight, um, so you can uh, you can actually you know you just use baking powder and you have like two more hours in your day. You know, like and these things are. Take that one off. It looks like it's getting. Burned. Yeah, if you can take it off and share it around, that'd be great. Um, no, just hands. Just like I guess I guess. Oh no, you can use the car high there. It's not cleaned out, but it's it's not. It has a sticker, but it's still good. So. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's butter. If uh, if people can come over, you can butter. There's butter and Hawthorne jam for the uh, for the breads if you like to have it on top. And I'm just mixing the uh, let's see the the einkorn wheat flour right now. The yeah it probably. Yeah, it could, it might, it might be. Well, take, take a look at it. I'm just looking at it from here. Okay. So we're going to grab this one Yeah, first. grab, grab that one first so that it doesn't touch. Okay. Yeah, just that way. Yeah, just that way. 
And it's only butter too, so it has less uh, less of the problem. So. It has uh, it has hawthor it has dried hawthorn berries. Uh, not a European variety, unfortunately. It's the Asian variety, but it's close. And uh, raw um, a raw cane uh, sugar and uh, lemon juice. All right, the butter one is now also in pan. Sorry, you can. It looks good. Oh, good. Oh, it's not and there is extra butter too right there if you want to use the spoon to spread on it with the uh, jam so Uh, it does, but a lot less than uh, Ooh, modern it's 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 some Yep, no, absolutely. That's why I'm kneading it, unlike the other one, so you can get the boot going. Because it is a wheat variety. Um, yeah. Yeah, with the one with the butter? Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's how I like making them, like as much butter as possibly fits in it. <laughs> you can do it with coconut. Uh, coconut... Um, Oh no, it tastes good too. Like the grains themselves are yummy, and it's sprouted too, right? So uh, I haven't tried it. So. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Po yeah, or porridge, right? So like a pottage and porridge is the most. Like if you're poor, that's the most common way to do it. Yeah, that's the one I use. Because it's like also too, just think about all the time you save not grinding it into freaking flour. Like so much time saved. Yeah, that way it's, you know, it didn't actually get into the jam, so it's actually Oh, yeah. Parch, yeah. Which is the process of, so with, that's why we use the metaphorically, oh, I'm parched, because it's all the water, you're all dried out. Yeah. And hot. I totally want to try this. I'm going to put this spoon in the crate because it got butter. Okay. It's sticking out over here because I, I don't want to close it. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's nice. It's nice. I'm not usually a big fan of I totally want to try doing a little piece of that one on the little hand one. <laughs> or is that the ash one? Uh, this is going to be in the ashes. Ooh. But we can try it on both just in case the yeah. ash one doesn't turn out. Oh my god, it's so good. Mm. When you have that much butter, anything's good. I'm gonna try the one without butter though. And, uh, lemon, lemon juice and lemon zest. I think. Yeah, that turned out nicely and moist on the inside. I was wondering how it would taste like. Definitely edible. The thing I like is there's like, when the recipe is so simple, you have to focus on the grains, not the recipe really. You can see how impoverished we are with the lack of grain selection and diversity we have nowadays.
this one, it's going to be in the ashes. So this is the uh, this is the Neolithic one. So it's the oldest style of cooking, obviously, just throwing stuff directly in a fire. <laughs> Yeah, no metal rods. They did have the stone cooking methods and they had pottery, right? Like uh, that time period, the pottery wasn't that great though, especially in that region, you're in the mountains. So the experiment's going to be, yeah, that's very, got the gluten well formed. So basically you're just making little pucks that will cook evenly and putting them in the fire. And we'll try maybe one or two on the, do you yeah. want to try one of the Viking irons there? Yeah. Okay. So, hey, you turn to mushrooms, okay. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, even 100 years ago, you're done. Do we want to do the flat one, or? Uh, whatever you want. It'll hold together on the spiral, so. Yeah. It's not like you have to make a pancake. And if we do the spiral, it'll still get some of the smoked flavor. Yeah. Uh, no, the malt was the one we just had. So it was malted oats. So this one is einkorn. So it's a, the it's the ancient it's an ancient wheat variety. Yeah, and this isn't going to be like this isn't optimized for deliciousness. <laughs> this is optimized for edibility while you're being chased through the Alps by a war band of some kind. <laughs> but at the same time. Today, we do, yes. And I'll make this one. I'll make this one super nice and flat because we don't have to worry about a charred layer on the outside. Did you hear that the Ice Man, his death might have been an inside job because he was carrying a rare copper axe? At the time? Well, yes. He may have also. Um, he also had uh, arsenic in his hair, and he'd been involved with copper smelting, but not recently. Previous to that, several months before. So it may have been an intercommunity problem between uh, a mountainous community that had an ore or ability for ore, and like a more southern area, which was creating ax which was creating copper axes. Uh, so uh, it's it's hard to say. There's so many different theories. Like there's a lot of really cool podcasts and like reinterpretations. And, writing, yeah. writing this story, yeah. telling this life and death. Yeah. But they didn't take the axe. They left the axe. Right, because like my thought is, is that the, he was with a group of people, and they were being chased. Right, either that or the, or or he died and was so they fought they fought them off down the mountain. So either they got chased, his group got chased up the mountain and through the pass because he was on in a pass area going to the other side of the Alps. But uh, uh, but that was like foreign territory, the other side of the Alps because he had. Um, None of the water in his teeth, like the layers in his teeth, and during any time of his life did he ever live for any extended period of time on that side of the Alps. He was always on the side that he was killed on, even though he was at the very top. So there may have been some sort of thing, either they were coming or going from the other side. Um, so there may have been a, like a, some sort of you know, community fracas. And he also fell down between two, two sets of rocks and was almost instantly buried by snow. So you have to think, maybe this whole thing took place during a snowstorm, like a whiteout almost. And so, the, but he was shot from 150 meters away, roughly. If, if the person who shot him was using the same weight of bow that he was carrying, which is a 90 pound bow, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Are you good? Yeah, so there is a, so I'm making this one wider, so Viking style, so it'll cook faster. I can maybe do the ash, because they want some of the ashes. So you want to hold it over, so you go from this side, it's closer. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, in that area. Yeah, they thought it was just Neolithic, but no. Yeah. I'll try, I'll try a few experimental that are a bit uh, thinner and a few that are a bit thicker. So uh, essentially like caveman steaks, um, I don't know if you've seen that, it's like a hipster way of cooking a steak directly on coals nowadays. Oh. Okay. Yeah, they're calling it caveman steak. I'm gonna essentially try the bread the exact same way. Because there's another way of doing it where you have a, a fire that's been going for a very long time and you just put it in the white ashes and then it's really slowly heated from the other coals. You know, I'm gonna be doing the, the quick variety because we only have a small fire. And this is what I'm imagining was probably more Iceman's uh, 
sort of style because they probably tried to create a really quick fire and didn't want that they likely didn't want to smoke up for very long they probably set it at night so that uh, you couldn't see the smoke from far off um, one of the things too in the Alps you have to think if you're setting a fire um, at night you can see the flame from very far off so you'd have to set it in like a nook area and there's a lot of stony boulders in the areas they were in right that they found in so it might have been a night and camping location so all sorts of neat stuff there yeah, it's exactly the same. Like it's Italy, Austria, Switzerland. It's all in that area. At least some near the edges. Yeah. Carefully. <laughs> I also have the ass talk. Yeah, how's that cooking? Has it been flipped yet? No. I have not flipped it yet. I was there you go. Okay, so you can see it's cooking. The heat of the fire is much hotter in that location. Yeah. So you can actually you can feel the heat of it. Yeah. I think ancient cooks also had, uh, like modern professional chefs, but most people had really hands that could really handle heat uh, just because they were constantly dealing with fire all the time. Yeah. Got a burn here? Which one? On Shelly's? Is Shelly starting to burn? Or what you no, it was, I was getting the smoke in my face. This one's charred a bit on one side. <laughs> yeah, my first job when I was um, 16 was working as a dishwasher. Oh, yeah. At an all you can eat buffet. Oh, oh it's non stop, eh? Only one person, only one person doing the dishes. Oh my God. That's Three insane. people in the kitchen, four like, waitresses, and a bartender. I have asbestos hands. And the bleach as well. Yeah. Because all the all the silverware is pre soaked in bleach. Yeah. Yeah. Very hard. Yeah, I was sixteen and an idiot. I should have should have found something better. Well, you know, probably not. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's impressive. Hmm? Yeah, fast cooking. Boom, done. Yeah. This one might be done. Yeah, that's done. Yeah, it's probably done. Something into the fire. It certainly is inevitable when it's done. Stick it back on the board. Yeah, you can just uh, yeah. wait. For the it's more. I was trying to also yeah, get perfect myself tortilla ish. Yeah. yeah. Well, we forgot to cut the other ones into actual pearls. They're actually bannocks. Maybe we can cut these into pearls. This isn't a flint knife, I'm sorry guys, it's not that authentic. <laughs> Thanks. So this is the non-ash covered ones. <laughs> it's an interesting texture. All right, if anybody wants one, come on over, try them out. Nice. 
not jamming. It should be doughy in the middle. Mm -hmm. it, it is. is. It is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Soft and. Oh yeah, yeah. That's perfect appetizer. That's the Yags open for lunch. That's why Tim had to step out just to try. Uh... Oh good. <laughs> That's a really cool flavor. It almost has a flavor of um, like really high quality pasta. Yeah. 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 Like a durum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the durum related? Um, I don't know. I don't know how the durum was bred. I know the majority of the durum's genetic code is the is a different wheat variety, but. Einkorn was crossbred with other stuff, but the problem is uh, Einkorn has a, uh, it's really complicated because the three different varieties of wheat all have different numbers of chromosomes. So they're, they're difficult to breed together, but they have bred and provided like, uh, what is it, Tricale or whatever? Yeah. That's a yeah. hybrid of two different wheat okay. um, yeah. varieties. So I don't know, I don't know which one, uh, I'd have to, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Are you going to cut those? Yeah, I'll cut these too. You're yeah, the main jar bits. The alleged bad bits. Well, they could be. So, you know, when you go to a fancy pizzeria and they get a bit of that crumb. Yeah, but there, you don't want too thing. much of it, so. No, no, I know. Um, I, they, probably, they probably did this. Very cool. And with or not, too. Yeah. You gonna flip for me there? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's quite doughy. Yeah. Oops. Ooh. Yeah, probably want to get those babies out. Of okay, I'll get those ones out then. Oh, I'm looking forward to Oh, um, I don't know if you guys were here when you were mentioning what I was mentioning earlier. If you're interested, once this wraps up, I'm going to be taking there some people up to the network of little signs up behind the fire. If you guys are seeing that, feel free to take off. Yeah, those might be a little, a little crunchy. A little crunchy. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a butter bit, but it's sweetened, so it doesn't have it has sugar in it, so that's why it's not. I actually like the smoke that's added. Yeah. It seems, I don't know, I mean, it softer, the but maybe because it's sat a little bit longer. Oh, the because middle is, is much more, uh, much wetter because it's yeah. thicker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's so <laughs> moist. It has, I, I mean, you know, so that's good. good. That would make really beautiful bread. Mm hmm yeah, this is super rough. Like, it tastes good though. I really like the flavor of that wheat. I'm about to make it into the other recipes. You're right. Yeah. It's got an interesting bitter component to the flavor. Mm -hmm. no, which it isn't. It has a flavor. A lot of bread. Yeah. Don't, don't have yeah. a flavor. Nope. Nope. Yeah. And that's the problem. It's like um, rice and grain. Oh, there's different kinds of rice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's good to try different kinds because you, well, you keep the same kind, it gets boring. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We, we really lost that, that, that tradition. And who knew? Yeah, pretty cool. Who knew? You can cook your bread fire. Yeah. And, and of course, if it's yeasted, it would be so much more delicious. Or like a, a bannock style with like a leavening agent, chemical leavening agent yeah, would be good too. That's, that's why I was wondering how that particular style sourdough. Yeah, it would be it would be a lot like a rye sourdough, mm -hmm. um, a bit more because the gluten content would be smaller, but it would still hold together like a regular bread. Like so, you you'd be able to do it in uh, in the fire. The thing is, rye breads are very difficult to do as cold breads because they they crumble really easily. Yeah. So. 
That's why you have to use these kinds of hands really well. Mm -mm. Anyways, that's it for the workshop, everybody. So thank you very thank much. You so much. Thanks. You want some cute gasoline? I already had some. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. So what's that? You haven't tried the uh, final one yet? Okay, yeah, try these. Uh, I'm saving these because I didn't take a picture. I forgot to take any, like, thumbnail shots. You're saving that? Okay. Yeah, no, no, just the ones on my hand. Here? Yeah, so that's the uh, the Iceman bread. Oh, yeah. I was, and there's I was extra butter and stuff if you want. Uh, oh, try your jam. And the yeah. 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 And I'll take a picture of some of these crumbs. <laughs> Super spy, yeah. yeah. Finding out metallurgy techniques of a. Yeah, yeah. could have been. Or, well, be I remember that guy who invented some cheap summer. I'm really convinced of the group thing, though. It's not just the individual. Well, but one of the stories that I had read was that he was uh, killed by the, uh, the other side. Thank you very much for sticking around to the end of that episode, Hearthsters. Uh, remember to like and share this video, of course. And on the screen, there should be some links to uh, other videos of mine. May your hearth be ever hale and hearty. Until next time, friends. <laughs>